We're in the last section of chapter 16. The Dutch Republic in the 17th century. This takes place from about 1600 to about 1713. There's a specific date, actually, that matters in 1713. We'll get to that in a little bit. But this is the 17th century, and this is the period of history where the Dutch have their so-called golden age, where they are sort of the most important country, uh, maybe next to France. They're not quite as powerful as France under Louis XIV, but they're more stable, and they're just as wealthy, and they're, they're, they're moving along with the third form of government. So we've already done absolutism in France. We've done constitutionalism in England. And now here's the third one, which is a republic. So they're the only republic anywhere in Europe at this point. And it's probably the most advanced society, modern, advanced, prosperous, free, of any place in Europe at the time. England is going to get there at this very same time. As you know, England is going through the, the, the Stuart dynasty, the Ch James Charles, Cromwell, Charles, James, William and Mary. That takes 80-some years to get them to have a, a, a Bill of Rights and a, a stable political system, but the Dutch are already there. The Dutch, the last time we heard about the Dutch, were uh, fighting a war of, of independence against the Spanish, which they eventually won with the help of England. You remember that? The defeat of the Spanish Armada, mainly by England, but also the Dutch were a part of that too. So du the Dutch achieved their independence from Spain um, early 1600s. And from that point on, they became this remarkably uh, prosperous, forward-thinking society. So let's get into it. Here we go. The Golden Age of the Netherlands. That's the title. That's their age. This is when they achieved, of course, independence from Spain, which was ultimately finally confirmed by the Treaty of Westphalia that ended the Thirty Years' War, but fundamentally they were already free. Very modern worldviews developed, modern worldviews here in the Netherlands. Let's just take a look at the Netherlands here real quick. Here's the most important city, uh, Amsterdam. And as we learned of previously when we studied this, uh, back in chapter 15 at the start of the Dutch Revolt. The city of Amsterdam and all of the Netherlands is really below sea level. That's why it's called the Low Countries. And these, these cities are known for canals and having great uh, access to the sea and for transportation and shipping. So this is a very, it's just geographically positioned for success. Politically, Local merchant oligarchies, oligarchy is when you have a few people with all the power, these are merchants, middle class merchants, hold a lot of the power in the Netherlands. They called them regents, regents. Let me get you to a picture of these guys. These, these are the, these business people, merchants, groups of them, become the political leaders of the city, really. Sort of sounds a little bit like Florence and, and with the Medici. And these guys are really the most powerful people in the country, and they deal with all of the domestic issues in Dutch society. And they always look like this in paintings. They always wear the black top hat, the, the white collar, and the full black um, clothing. They always look like, a lot of times they have a, a collar too, like a ruffled, looks like sort of a, you know, a cone collar or something like that. But these are the, these businessmen run the country. There is something called a states general. That's the parliament, states general. But it's relatively weak. It handles only foreign issues and occasionally war. So that's a, it's not powerful, though. The states general appointed what was called the stadtholder. The stadtholder was like a ceremonial governor. Remember, there were provinces in the Netherlands. The, the, the northern Dutch provinces became the Netherlands. Well, each, you know, each uh, province had a stadtholder, which was like a governor, someone sent by the, the parliament to kind of, a, you know, be a, a figurehead leader of each province, okay? But the stadtholder is kind of a, a weak position, just like the parliament. The merchant oligarchies, the regents, deal with the society, Okay. Which province dominated of those northern ones? Of course, Holland. Holland, which is well, this. This is Amsterdam again. This is the capital 
of Holland, the province of Holland, and it's famous for its canals and beautiful. All of these buildings, this is all constructed in the Dutch Golden Age, which we're looking at right now. So incredible uh, architecture of the city. Here's a painting of it. Well positioned for trade. Remember that. So this, the Dutch form a republic where they have representative government. No monarch, no king, no absolutism. It's a republic where these strong middle class people with their middle class values are the dominant group. Okay? So that's the situation. It's a republic which means you have representatives, those local merchant guys, the regents, represent the society and they make the decisions for everybody, but they are chosen, all right? The Dutch were also known as a confederation. So a confederation is a good government word to know. It means that you have strong local government, like these regents, the middle class men of each city. But it also means a confederation that you have a weak national government. So like the states general and the stadtholder are the national government, that's relatively weak. Power is local. So in America, we don't have a confederation. We have a federal republic where the national government in Washington is much stronger than the state's governments and the city governments like Arizona or Tucson. We, we have that identity as Americans first. So we're a federation, a confederation. Think of like the Confederacy in the Civil War where they wanted states' rights above everything, strong states, weak national. That's what the Dutch were doing in the 17th century, okay? So that's the political situation. The political success of the Netherlands always, like everything else in that country, is based on economic prosperity. This is the richest country anywhere in Europe at the time. And those always go hand in hand, usually, in government. <clears throat> economic prosperity tends to reinforce political stability, and political stability tends to reinforce economic prosperity. You need both. So the Dutch values, they are thrifty, which means they're cheap, and they practice frugality, F-R-U-G-A-L-I-T-Y. It means you're very good with money. They're very conscious of their budget. They don't overspend. They have that Protestant or Calvinist work ethic because the country's filled with, with Calvinists. So they're all hard workers believing that working hard is pleasing to God and that's their calling in life. You guys are good with money. Here's another thing they do that's unique in Europe. They practiced religious toleration for almost everybody. Jews were welcome, minority groups, and they said if anyone that has a, a, a good sense of wanting to make money and be a part of society, come on up here, we'll take you in. So the result of, of them practicing tolerance is that they attracted a good deal of wealthy people who weren't really welcome other places. Foreign investment went up. The banks were stable, increase in wealth and trade because they were tolerant. So again, this is the most progressive modern society pretty much anywhere in Europe at the time. The banks of the Netherlands became the leading source of Europe's finances. They replaced the Medici Bank out of Florence in this century, really moving out of the, even the previous century. So the, the commercial center of Europe shifted to first Antwerp, as we know, and then eventually Amsterdam. Okay, this is a very important place. The fishing industry is huge in the Netherlands. This is one of the big things that they actually do that they produce is fish. Most of the other things that they do are they're, tra they're traders, they trade, but they actually do have a large fishing industry in the Netherlands. They built these, these, this government of the Netherlands, built a huge merchant marine, which are a fleet of 16,000 ships. Half of all the trading ships in Europe were Dutch. 16,000 trade ships as part of the Merchant Marine. Merchant Marine is, is ships that are not military, they're for business. And the Dutch produced, therefore, the lowest prices for shipping of any country in Europe. If you want to send something or get something from one part of the world to the other, you use the Dutch. The Dutch are like FedEx, okay, the world on time. They're the greatest sh shippers anywhere. And they're on time, efficient, and cost-effective. And so the Dutch trade in all kinds of things. They're like, they're like you can, they're middlemen, you can, but you can get anything in the world from them because they got ships going all over the globe to trade and do business with other people. So you can get 
um, diamonds, pottery, linen, the scientific instruments, guns. They're, they're like a whole market. Anything you need comes through the Netherlands. And they deal at wholesale prices, which means you buy in bulk and you get a discount. So that should instantly remind you of Costco. The Dutch are like the Costco of Europe in the 17th century. You buy a lot in bulk, you get a good deal, but you got to buy a lot, okay? So this is it, a huge market, diamonds, linens, everywhere, okay? And how do they do it all? What's this fleet of ships? It is the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch East India Company is the name of the trading company that's, uh, it's not owned by the government. Now, this is a separate one. This is a joint stock company, which means it's a private business where you can buy stock in it. You can be a shareholder. In fact, it's one of the fir world's first companies where you can buy stock. And so then, as an individual, you not only own part of the company, which is what all a share of stock is, but you can share in the profit. So when the company does well and makes a, makes a profit, the investors also get a return. So the, the Dutch East India Company started off as government run, but then it was turned into a company where citizens can buy a share of it. And so the investment just goes way up. Everyone wants a piece of this. The Dutch East India Company, remember, cut into Portuguese trade in East Asia and took that over. So they're running all the way from India back to Amsterdam nonstop. And the Dutch East India Company was so successful at trading, remember this is just a trading company, a fleet of ships, that they got a 35% return on their investment. So if you invested a, a, a sum of money and bought stock, you got 35% annually back on what you put in. That's one of the, that's even by modern standards, that's an incredible uh, profit that, was to be, that could be made if you invested in this company. They also had a Dutch West India Company, whose primary purpose was to go to Latin America and Africa, but the East India Company is the one that they're most famous for. Social life in the, in the Dutch Golden Age. It's the highest standard of living anywhere in Europe uh, for almost every group. People uh, of the middle class were thriving at this point at the same time that they're really going away in Spain, the middle class. They're rising in the Netherlands. People have access to the surplus grain uh, there are stable food prices. You can get food from all over the world. Look at this family here, this middle-class Dutch family. Look at all the things on their table. There's a lobster tail sitting there. There's wealthy dogs as pets. Everyone is dressed nicely. There's wine at the table. Uh, these guys are well-fed, prosperous, and happy. That's the story of the Dutch. Wages are high even for women. So this is one of the only places on earth where women were paid a decent wage. And there was plenty of food. Look at this. This is a, a Dutch still life painting from the 17th century. People were just really into luxury items and food from around the world. Healthy people. Like, this is like AJ's. Look at these things. There's oysters there. There's, there's shellfish. There's, you know, delicacies and pastries and you know, in little boxes from all over the place. So this is high-end stuff, and it's affordable because people are prosperous, all right? So it's like AJ's or Trader Joe's or something like that. There was never any food riots in the Netherlands. People ate well, were paid well. It's just a great life. Uh, prosperity in the Netherlands led to the Dutch creating colonies elsewhere in the world. The Dutch are going to go to East Asia and take over what we know as Indonesia, uh, today, that was a, a, one of the first Dutch colonies. The Dutch go into Latin America briefly for some colonies. They also head down toward the southern tip of Africa uh, to found what they call Cape Town, which is the first Dutch colony in Africa. And of course, that's uh, known as South Africa today. That has a long Dutch heritage. So the Dutch are, are you know, taking their prosperity and going all around the world. The Golden Age of the Netherlands pretty much came to an end with the War of Spanish Succession, which ended in 1713. Remember, the, one of the leaders, Prince William of the Netherlands, he was one of those Stadtholder guys of Holland, he became King of England. Remember that in the Glorious Revolution? And so then he, as both King of England and one of these guys from the Netherlands, had to help pay for the War of Spanish Succession against the French. 
It was very costly. It cost the Dutch dearly, and this is sort of the beginning of their economic decline. But from about 16, you know, 20 or so, almost 100 years to 1713, the Dutch were on top of the world, basically. This was the place to be. That's it. Chapter 16, over.